Test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to clarifying the role and value of the Chief Customer Officer. We are lucky enough to have one of the world-renowned speakers, Gene Bliss, uh, with us today who will be walking through just that. Gene Bliss is the president and founder of Customer Bliss and the co-founder of the Customer Experience Professionals Association. She's a consultant and thought leader and recognized as one of the pioneers of the chief customer officer role. She's the author of I Love You More Than My Dog, Chief, uh, which, is what, which is one bestseller. Uh, a second bestseller she had was Chief Customer Officer. And her most recent book, which is uh, the one featured on the screen here, is Chief Customer Officer 2.0. Uh, Jean Bliss has held uh, the first ever Chief Customer Officer position at some of the biggest companies in the world, such as Land's End, Microsoft, Coldwell Banker, and Allstate Corporations. And she has also uh, consulted with many, many, many of the Fortune 500 companies. Um, in her role, she was reporting uh, directly to the CEO and has moved the customer uh, experience to the strategic agenda, redirecting priorities to create transformational, transformational changes to each brand's customer experience. She has driven 95% loyalty rates and uh, has been improving customer experience across 50,000 uh, person organizations plus. So these, she is really working with the biggest organizations in the United States of America and all over the world uh, she actually also does some consulting in the Middle East. So um, with, uh, and in just in a short while, I'll get her to start speaking. I just wanted to mention a few things to you. This is an interactive session. So if you have any questions, there is a question box on the right-hand side. I already had one from uh, a few individuals saying they couldn't hear us, but uh, I hope uh, now that we've started, you can hear us okay. Um, so you can send us questions. We will receive those. We will respond to those, and you can send questions, um, and I can uh, highlight them to uh, Jean, either while she's doing the presentation or at the end. And as well, at the end of the presentation, there will also be a QA. and uh, I also just wanted to mention uh, Jean was planning on, on being on video. However, she is a little sick, and it is um, the crack of dawn. I don't think the sun has risen yet in California, so um, uh, she's just preferred uh, not to be on video, but uh, all the insights and um, need of the presentation will still be there for all of you looking to improve the customer experience or improve uh, your careers within the customer experience space. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over now to Jean Bliss, who is a true guru in the field of the chief customer officer and the chief and the customer experience. So, Gene, uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning, and uh, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Oh, you're welcome, Shane, and good afternoon to everybody over there. And again, my sincere apologies for not having the uh, video camera on um, just a little bit under the weather today. So. Thanks so much, and it's a pleasure to be with you all. Well, we're going to spend a little bit of time today um, chatting and walking through what's, this is the culmination of 30 years of being a practitioner inside of organizations, as well as what Shane mentioned was um, the past 12 years of coaching leaders around the world on how to do this work to prevent it from being a one-off one or a reaction to a survey score, but really a transformational effort. And it starts with what the purpose of the work is. And the work is really to earn the right to growth by improving customers' lives. And that moves this work from being something that's nice to have to a growth strategy. Moving the customer to, to have an improved life, to have an improved business, really is how you earn the right. Not go get loyalty, but earn the right to growth. But this is the, the way that we all normally live our lives, which is instead of delivering a one company experience to our customers, people are working hard. And the thing, fact of the matter is they're working hard separately. Now these may or may not be your silos, but you probably recognize them as silos. And so the work of the chief customer officer is to unite the organization. I call it the human duct tape of the organization. Shane, does everybody, would everybody, would that term resonate with people? Yes, absolutely. I believe so. 
think. Uh, Great. So, so here's what happens in most organizations because of the way that people are working hard in their silos but working hard separately. We're delivering accidentally in most cases a random experience to customers which is the outcome of everyone doing their own thing. Think of Think about an experience you might have, for example, calling an airline. Not all airlines, but some airlines, it's a random experience. How you get treated depends on the day, depends on which call center you were routed to, and depends on who answers the phone. You know, I, I think about this as service roulette almost. So you call up, ring, 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 and let's say you accidentally, which is more commonplace now, uh, place the, uh, buy your ticket for the wrong day. So the first person you get is a policy cop, and they're just going to tell you why you did it wrong, what went wrong, and that you're basically out of luck. So for me, I, I say thank you very much, and I hang up, and I think, ah, oh, let me try this again. Ring, ring, I reach another kind of person. She's in the same role, but she's been there longer, and she knows how to navigate things. Now, she, I may not be able to get away from a fee to her for changing my ticket, but this person's going to give me options. She's really going to understand my life, and she's going to solve the, my situation for me, and I feel completely different hanging up those two phone calls. But that's random. Now, some people may say that's good service, but that is not what builds your brand. Good service and good customer experience is about reliability, especially in a world of social media. If you're not delivering an experience that one customer can say to another, here's what I get, here's how long it takes, here's what they deliver for me, and here's how it feels, because feelings are one of the most important and most, most talked about things in social media, then you can't earn the right to growth because your customer isn't going to tell others. They're not going to become that advocate for you that we all know is now a growth engine. And this is about being reliable at the context or the intersection points that matter most to customers. In most of our businesses, just being reliable, especially because even if our business model might not be totally complicated, such as clothing or retail stores, because customers now have multiple channels to interact with us, the one company experience is more difficult to deliver because you've got you know, mobile working separately from online, working separately from the retail stores. And so reliability in of itself drives differentiation. And I'm a fan of this final word I've got here, which is desire. Loyalty has inadvertently become something that we go get from customers. For example, a, a company may do a really important correlation study that says two, a customer that buys two lines of business from us are more loyal. You know, we've all seen that, that data. But instead of putting our eggs in earning the right to the customer coming back by making the first experience fantastic and memorable, we spend money with a, more money with our marketing dollars to try to go get more customers. So we're spending all our money on our acquisition engine, but not as much, for some reason, on earning the right to growth, to organic growth, of those customers we've already brought into the door. And so desire, think about as the cha-ching emotion, meaning if you create an experience that customers desire, they want to have it again. They're going to tell other people about it, and that will grow your business. So here's a question that I have, and I, I, I love that I can ask this around the world. Has anybody not bought something from Amazon? You know, I, I, I'm not sure how prevalent Amazon is in, in your part of the world. Is it, It's pretty yeah, it's prevalent. Absolutely. Is absolutely. I think, okay. uh, I think we have Amazon, and then we also have souk.com, which is, which is uh, growing quickly. But I think everybody, as you said, has purchased something from Amazon.com. Okay, isn't it crazy? So Amazon sold their first book in 1995. They were, this isn't a wow engine, it's a reliability engine. They know what you need, they show you where it is, they are, keep on track of it. But they built this business and built the ability to build in every single type of these categories by doing books right first then being reliable about music. And, and it goes way beyond Zappos, of course. I ran out of slide space. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is that this company 
and your company earns the right to perhaps moving beyond how you started growing by being reliable in the first thing that you did. So reliability drives growth and drives word of mouth and therefore is your growth engine. Ninety-two percent of consumers worldwide now trust recommendations from friends and family and let me define friends and family. People are considering friends to be not only the people they know but the people they go on the internet and they read the feedback from complete strangers about those three things I mentioned before. How the experience was reliable, how you improved my life, and how it felt. And people are using this as a decision-making lever as they decide who to buy from, who to get services from. Nine, and that is 92% of the time, and that's up 74% from 20, 2007. And so the point of this is, again, if you're not reliable, you're not going to earn that word of mouth. And then finally, <clears throat> one final plea of importance around the importance of reliability in your experience and the work of the chief customer officer or whoever this, this role might fall to, customer experience leader or perhaps just a consortium of people as you're trying to figure out how to get to this work, is the London School of Economics says that there is a 300% revenue gain to be achieved by reducing negative word of mouth, which comes from what? Not being there, not being reliable, bouncing the customer around, not delivering a one company experience versus improving positive buzz. So I'm going to walk you through these five competencies of customer experience competence, cust companies which define the role of the chief customer officer, define the role of the human duct tape of the organization to unite leaders and unite the organization so that it shows up as we are here to improve your life to customers. The first competency, and I want to say a word here first also around why I call these competencies. For so long now, this work has been defined by being reactive. We react to the cycle of the survey score or we react to a leader going out in the field and seeing something and bringing it back and that becomes the focus of the organization. Or we react to market changes and therefore we stop doing things that are important for customers because we're, we just want to you know, hang in there. But the idea of competencies is that these are embedded into the organization. They drive how we bring a product to market. They drive how we do annual planning. They are not work layered on top of the quote real work. They become a part of the decision making engine of the work of the organization. And that's why this chief customer officer role is becoming more and more relevant, becoming more prevalent, as I'm sure you're seeing, Shane, is around uniting the organization. And the first competency is to honor and manage customers as assets. And so this is really creating for the leaders and the organization a new success metric that defines did we or did we not earn the right to customer driven growth. You know, we this means starting with what customers actually did versus using what they said via survey results as the only indicator of how we're doing. So it's pretty simple. And I call it customer math. So the work of the organization is to come up with a one company version of this. What is the volume of your new customers that you brought in this past quarter or month? Or year and what is their value what is their potential value and what is the volume and value of your lost customers this past month or quarter or year before annual planning and I encourage you here not to use retention rates but to use whole numbers we brought in 50,000 customers but we lost 30,000 customers and so our net asset growth is 20,000 not 50,000 because we focus so much on the sales number and the acquisition number, the work here is to instead focus on, as a one company, did we, beyond the sale, earn the right to growing and keeping this customer? And did they move from a category of purchase that they per came in from to a higher level of, of, cate of category of their value as a customer? 
there's that's the operational side of it the cultural side of this is to move our leadership team to unite in how they use this information kick off key meetings transparently sharing this because as a company the outcome of if we did or did not grow has to do with this and this honor word is just as important what this means is if we are honoring our customers as assets are there rules and policies that get in the way of delivering this experience that we should get rid of you know I've had clients lose 50 million dollar customers because of a 25 dollar policy change mm. How right. Many million, how many million dollar customers? A fifty million dollar customer, and it's it was a succession of them, Shane. And what happened was, it ha once it happens once, it's fine. But it, but it happened, and and the price, the the policy was changed. The the fee was changed. It was a change fee for something. So the customer calls in the person working with them. They get a bill for a policy for a, for a change fee. They call customer service, they call their account rep, and the account rep go, waves it, right? Because that's random experience. I, you've now made me do something to waive a, pr a policy or a price change that you should have done in the first place because you know what kind of asset I am. But then it kept happening because as an organization, they didn't systematize that inside their company. They didn't say, gosh, we've got customers getting angry because of this policy this is probably something we should maybe make time made sense at the time and so it happened a couple more times and they kept waving it but it they just said enough is enough we're gonna we're gonna when when time comes we're gonna go look for another another person to help company to help us hmm. Wow and it's those little things it's the little things when the customer thinks you know me you know how much I value you and you still do this Does that make sense it's unbelievable. Yeah, I think uh, you know we've all we've all been there. We've 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 switched brands because of exactly what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, and and this is about making creating a deliberateness around killing what I call stupid rules, and helping the or the organization and the front line um, have the ability to identify them without fear and get rid of them. Um, I'm going to skip that one case study and, and walk through an, a, another thing that I think is we've done with some great success, which is to tell the story of your customer assets visually, because that's why you'll see in that slide I had shown previously, we show a red, a black bar above the line, which is the incoming customers, and a red bar below the line. And so, make this take customers off your spreadsheets here. This is not about simply going through that and talking about retention rates, but you want to make customers alive. That's why I like the whole numbers. One of the things that we did at one of the largest um, membership companies here in the United States is we, we introduced this idea, we did the math with the leadership team, the C-suite of this very large you know, multi-billion dollar company, and we presented them with two big jars of marbles. Um, they were quite large. And uh, we had done the mathematical equation of incoming and outgoing customers, and we we showed them that in two jars of marbles. And in fact, the jar of marbles with the lost customers had more marbles in it than the new wow. incoming customers, which meant that all of the money that they were spending to bring in new customers was essentially lost, plus then some, which was their incre incremental growth, their revenue, and their profitability. And so then that created the connection between customer experience and ROI. This isn't something nice to have. And then you know what else you can say, Shane? What's that? Uh, we lost our marbles. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. I know, right? So customers as assets is about is an attitude shift not a dashboard. It means moving leaders to fearlessly unite and to make this be a new success metric that they talk about with as much rigor as sales and profitability because where this asset goes, so does your growth. And it's caring about the why. You know, it's not enough about asking the numbers. 
and knowing the number. It's got to be about the why. And that's what you're going to see in the rest of these competencies is that they build to tell a humanly driven story about the why. Why were customers' lives impacted? And it's earning the right to growth. Now, I, I just had a meeting with the executive team of a very, very large $30 billion company yesterday. And we had a good conversation, which is, you know, you may not be able to impact all of the reasons why customers leave, but somewhere in around the 70% of why they leave, 70% of customers who leave, you can impact that. And so that's still a lot of marbles. That's a lot of customers. So without this, we really lose the connection of how our work drives growth. Competency two is aligning around experience. And this means uniting how we talk about and how we move and elevate the higher purpose of our work from the silos and the silo report out to discussing the customer's journey. This gives leaders a framework for guiding the work of the organization. So this, for example, is a draft stage of journeys around a B2B client that I had. But the work is not to map all these touch points and to have the visio blind, blindness, right, chain a, a bunch of process maps or charts in a, in a binder somewhere. But the first piece of this is to change leaders' language, how they ask for accountability, not down the silos, but rather across the journey. Ask what's happening by journey stage. And when you do that, it requires multiple silos. And now your, your, your people inside of your company are going to see that that's behavior that they need to model. They need to come together in groups to work to improve complete experiences that your customer is thinking of versus those KPI and operational metrics that Second thing this does is it creates focus. Instead of what a word, a term that Microsoft called boiling the ocean, instead of trying to solve for everything, we know that there's probably 10 to 15 critical intersection points that you have in your organization. Focus on those. Unite your organization to, to work together to improve those, those things that connect back to your customer asset growth or loss. And when you do this, your journey becomes a business decision blueprint because you can, by stage of your journey, actually start asking questions of what we will and will not do for the customer. I'm sure, I want to show you the first journey map for the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, uh, D.C., in, in the United States, because if you haven't visited, you've, you've probably heard about the Smithsonian, and it's, it's kind of an iconic place from an experience standpoint. They um, entertain about 30 billion people a year there, but yet they hadn't until this past year done a journey of uh, what it was like to visit this, this wonderful, wonderful location. And because they hadn't done a journey map, the silos were in full force upon your very first experience in entering what they call the main rotunda. So if you walked into the main rotunda of the Smithsonian, you'd see one desk that uh, was selling um, tickets to um, the, the big movies that they have there. You'd see another desk that was um, somebody directing you, but you didn't know that that was the directing vet desk because all it said was, do you want help? And then there was another desk that um, was just people with comment cards trying to get your feedback on your experience at the Smithsonian. So if you were somebody walking into the Smithsonian and wanted help, you didn't know which, where, which one of these desks to turn. And the reason is each one of these were run by a different silo of the Smithsonian. And each one of them would point you to the other desk when you had you know, naturally walked to the wrong one. And isn't that amazing, Shane? That, that is. I mean, it's, it's almost like you're um, kind of breaking down the traditional approach uh, to strategy and putting the, the journey map, almost replacing that in a sense. That's right. And so I'm going to show you here the map. Um, can you see this okay? Yes. So I, what I love about this is that they are addressing um, the emotion 
the reliability of the experience, and did you improve my life? And, and, and here's why. So they're not only building the journey um, for while you're there, but they're, they're, they're figuring out how they can impact the consider going experience. The experience of helping you organize the trip. They've created all these digital planning tools now. And so to your point, Shane, if you think of the steps, it will drive reliability in steps that were previously random because you didn't realize they were a step. They will create innovation and set you apart by creating an experience where there was not one before, where it was it fell on the customer to unite your silos. It fell on your customer to say, okay, I called this hall and got this. I went on this part. You know, they all had their own separate websites too, all these different museums. I went here and got this and I got this. This became now the aggregator. So you've got the consider going, organize the trip, arrive uh, at campus. So hold, they had, see this, this one thing that says entry logistics. <coughs> Excuse me. Then the experience, experience a building. And then, of course, leave a building. What's your leaving a building experience? What's your exiting campus experience? And then the back home, memories and sharing to create that desire to pull it back again. And this is the opportunity that companies have with building a journey map. And, and, and unfortunately, what's happened is a lot, of, a lot of the work around this is thought of as let's do a lot of touch point mapping and start fixing things immediately. But if we don't first create this path for the decision, the decision blueprinting, then we've missed the main opportunity. And we've also missed the opportunity for this language to start embedding leaders and the organization that it's not I'm you know I'm the people running the the the, the um, movies or whatever but how are we going to unite to create these deliberate experiences this could be applied to any business at all I mean, this is something that there isn't a single business couldn't use to increase the experience and hence profits it's exactly right and that's why it's the second competency it's changing language, it's uniting leaders, and it's switching the purpose of the business from something we want to go get to something customers want to achieve and receive from you. And when you do that, it becomes the framework for earning customer-driven growth. One of the other things that this does is when you start being deliberate about organizing by stage, it will also provide you with the decision-making template. So by stage of the journey, bring your front line and your people together and decide what you will always do to honor and value customers and what you will never do to distrust them or dishonor them. And now what this starts doing is tickling out of these stages and by stage becomes powerful because this is the uniting faction tickling out the, the behaviors that we've always done because that's the way we've always done it because that's what everybody else does. When you start kiboshing those things and getting rid of those things, that's what will set you apart. And by the way, do these for your employees also. By stage of the journey, what will we ensure for our employees? And what will we make sure we never do to our employees to dishonor them? So aligning around experience is uniting leadership to give them a business decision blueprint that drives accountability to customers' lives. The third competency is building a listening path. And what I mean by a listening path is uniting multiple sources of information, I'm going to show you in a minute, to tell the story of your customers' lives, of their experiences, and you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm gonna be a broken record about this by stage of the journey so that it moves everything together. And so this is seeking input and understanding and elevating and knowing at those moments what they need, what's important to them. But the power of this is uniting multiple sources of information to create a balanced story of feedback. And Shane, I'm sure you've seen this inside of the large organizations you work with. What happens is, you know, the, the research department might present the ethnographic information, or the social media group might present the social media information, or the survey results might come out, 
well, what happens is each one of those things are pre presented separately, and they then elicit random activities that start happening from all parts of the organization, which can be translated as customer-focused, but it's not in a strategic way, because by amalgamating multiple sources of information, you've got two things that start happening. Volume, the highest volume comes from this, is repeated over and over again from multiple sources and convergence, meaning that multiple sources tell you the same thing over and over again. And the power in this is that we also lose our dependency on survey. Now there's nothing wrong with surveys. Surveys are a really important part of this story, but we don't want the presentation of survey results to be as much about debating the survey methodology or wanting to do a regression analysis over and over again on the tool as it is really listen and understand and take this info information seriously. So my recommendation is to, to build, build a, a listening engine or a listening path that includes unaided or qualitative feedback, meaning what are the complaints that you receive from your customers, and create a system of categorization from every place that they're received so you can roll them up by stage of the journey. And then what what are the also survey feedback that you receive? But again, organize that and do the work to create a one company approach to surveying so that you don't have everybody sending something out based on their faction or their place in the, war, in the silos. And then, of course, organize them by one company categorization, but tell the story. Bring that information together, your social media, your complaint trending from multiple sources in your organization, your survey work, and map it by stage of the journey. So you're telling a story as a result of starting with competency one, as a result of the experience we delivered. Here's how much we grew or did not grow the customer base. We're now going to traverse the journey using competency two and show you what's happening in customers' lives. In stage three, which is entering our store, for example, our complaints trended up 50% this month. Our social media was also spiking here. And our survey results validate that. So you'll see we put the survey at the end as a numeric validation, not leading our empathy and understanding and really wanting to do something about this. And then finally, the other piece is experiential listening. This means walking in your customer's shoes and requiring leaders and your organization to do everything your customer has to do. So in this case, we'd say, and we had you walk into flat five stars yourself. How did you like that experience? And that, in fact, is one of the most powerful actions that Adobe has now taken to drive the transformation in their business. They have an executive immersion process where they require leaders on a quarterly basis, I believe, to go and, and go through these immersion processes where they have to do what customers do. And the beauty of this is, is that they have attached a percent of leaders' compensation to doing these immersion activities rather than attaching it to the survey score. So they're attaching it to the activities that drive their behavior and drive their change, not chasing the score. Pretty powerful, huh, Shane? Wow, yeah. So what, what exactly are they forcing their executives to do? Download things, um, go acquire things, access things, sign up for an account, anything a customer has to do. And, and you use the word force, which is interesting because in the beginning, and I know that was, in, that was inadvertent on your part, I'm sure, but in the beginning it may feel like an activity you have to go do. This has be become so popular. People are begging to be involved in this now. Excellent. So building a customer listening path is removing survey score addiction. I, I say that kind of it's a joke a little bit. We start with the score. We need to instead start with the story of customers' lives and unite that information to tell a one company story. So we're compelled to, to build and identify. The other piece of this is to, to unite the organization from going off on those well-intended dashboards 
to uniting the organization to focus on the few things that mean the most. Competency 4 is a building a proactive experience improvement engine, meaning knowing before customers tell you where things are not reliable. And I call it your revenue erosion early warning system. And this means in those top customer experiences, those top 10 to 15 intersection points that you now know because you've worked through competency two, um, aligning around experience, the work here is to identify and care about your operational performance. So you can think about this as operational listening. You should know about your operational performance, just a couple high-level metrics, with it, and care about that with as much rigor as you care about sales, EBITDA, growth, revenue numbers, because where your performance in these, these intersection points go, so does your performance in earning and growing long-term uh, organic growth from your customers. One of the things that's important here is, is getting to those processes and creating experiences that are reliable and deliberate. And so I offer a tool for you here, which is simply take the stages of your journey. And by the way, just coming up with a united set of stages written from the customer's viewpoint are, is a powerful cultural change. And underneath each of these, do an exercise with your leadership team and then share this with the rest of the organization, do this with the rest of the organization, which is by stage of the journey, do we always deliver a 100% reliable experience, no matter what channel, no matter what day, no matter what person, no matter what time of the year? Is it, if you go on the other end of the spectrum, red, a frequently unreliable experience? Our front line is constant have to do workarounds around this. It's just very difficult. Our customers constantly are having challenges with this. Or is it an it depends experience? Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And if you do this, and we provide our leaders with customer feedback, quotes, other things, so they have some fodder before they make these decisions. But if you're honest with yourself, and what happens with most clients when they're starting this, you'll identify that for most of the stages of your journey, you're in the red and yellow zone when you're starting this work. And why wouldn't you be? Because we've been doing our work, hard, hard work, but doing work separately. And what the customer sees is that random experience. And this is a very, very powerful galvanizing activity to unite the organization. Another thing that we've built is instead of calling them the, the intersection points moments of truth, we call them a defector pipeline. And in many organizations, that simply makes more sense to leaders. It resonates more with dollars and cents and growing the business. And so this happens to be a software as a service defector pipeline. And the goal here is to build that reliability, to, to build a competency in your organization for improving these moments. So for example, in SaaS, onboarding. What we know in a software as a service business that if you don't onboard correctly, it has everything to do with how much of that expensive software is actually purchased. Um, wh when you see a customer has bought a large amount of product from you, but is only purchased using or downloading a very small percentage of that, and even when a customer leaves you. So competency four, this is building the, the ability to make customer experience development in your organization, how you unite the team of people to solve problems and rebuild experiences as powerful and as heralded as new product development. It's your revenue erosion early warning system. It builds reliability by uniting the silos and it builds a customer experience development competency. The last competency is one company leadership and culture. I call these the prove it to me actions which enable your employees to deliver value. And this gets to the point of, you know, a lot of companies say they want to be customer focused, but are they? Are they really doing the things that enable the front line, the employees, and the employees in other areas of the silos to do the right things. You know, for example, if you say you're customer focused, but you send your sales rep to see so many clients that 
they can't really have meaningful strategic guiding decisions with them. It's more of a milk run. They've got to just go in, say hello, spend 20 minutes and leave. That's not really living up to what you said you're going to do. And so the notion of this is requiring the ability by, for leaders for embedding these five competencies. It starts with, for example, what we talked about earlier, by stage of the journey. What must we always do? And what must we get rid of for our employees? Um, and one of the most powerful things that we do to, to do this work is to build a customer room because accountability to customers and employees' lives is one of the things that is the most random that comes from this work. Yes, we present lots of data and information, but people go off and start cherry-picking actions in a well-intended way. But what the customer room does is it unites all of this information we just talked about. So it can be a physical room. It can also be something you put up and bring down. But the idea is to make it experiential. And you'll see here in this, in this draft of a customer room that it's, it's really to tell the story of customers' lives. And you start with customers as assets, and you visually show the growth or loss of your customer base. And then by stage of the journey, you'd say in stage three, for example, our complaints are trending, we, we have a problem here, our real-time complaint information is showing there's an issue. Operationally, that makes sense, that's competency four, because we're not delivering on that right cycle time. Our social media is spiking, and we sent you out to try to do this, how did you do it? And finally, by the way, our survey results are validating that. So we'll circle that issue. And as you take your leaders through every single one of your stages, you might have circled, let's say, 10, 15 things. But the power here is now as a leadership team, and again, you may be building multiple versions of these. As a leadership team, you're saying, okay, which three are we going to focus on? And as a leadership team, you're saying, okay, which high, high-value individuals in our business are we going to dedicate to working through solving this customer experience to improve customers' lives. And what this does is it drives regular accountability for talking about customers' lives, not on spreadsheets, not in PowerPoint decks, and it drives accountability for these teams working together and then presenting in subsequent customer rooms what's happening to improve customer lives. Here's an example of an actual customer room of a client of mine. It's a B2B customer room. Um, they, are, they, they are a huge developer of real estate and almost the entire infrastructure of o Orange County in um, Southern California here. And what you'll see here is on the left, they have the stages of the journey. In the middle, they have lots of information where they show customer videos, the information by stage, and then on the side they work out what they're going to do to improve customers' lives. And they actually bring leaders into this monthly and quarterly and also before annual planning. I've never seen, I don't have a single client who ha that I've, I've seen having one of those. Maybe they have one. They well, and, and, and maybe rare, you right? can... Well, they're becoming more and more prevalent and, and more and more important because it really becomes the uniter and it drives the work to a strategic level on a regular basis. So competency five is really, Shane, I call it the prove it to me competency. It unites behavior and accountability and it really enables people to deliver because now, you know, what, what you just said is interesting. If people may have meetings where they come together and they want to look at the customer projects, but looking at the, even those what we call the customer projects is red, yellow, green dots on a piece of paper that says, here's how far along we are in all of these things. What this does is regrounds them to never forget why we're here. So it really is a culture shift and a way to drive behavior change and strategic decision making. So I'm going to end the way that I began, which is these five competencies unite to tell the story of customers' lives. And by doing so, they build an engine for growth. And here's how they would knit together. As a result of the experience we delivered this past month or a quarter or year before annual planning, here's how all of us as a company 
earned the right to customer-driven growth. Here's how many new customers we brought in. Here's how many we lost. Here's the shift in their behavior that of the strength of their relationship or diminishment of their relationship with us, and here's why. Let's now traverse the journey that they're having with us by stage of the experience to understand why, to know more about what we're doing to them and for them so we can eliminate and increase experiences that mean the most to drive growth. In our stages of the journey, let me now unwind for you the story of customers' lives. In this stage, here is the trending of complaints. It's converging with social media information. We sent you off to try to download a document. This is where the majority of our complaints are spiking, and you can see in our survey results, we are trending lower here. And here are some of the verbatim comments. Let me show you the experience. Let's try to download one ourselves, shall we? We see that's a priority experience. Let's circle that. We have now identified that in this touch point, our cycle time of how long it takes for a customer, once they're unable to download this document, it takes them to get help and to actually be able to download it. It's two days. It should be 20 minutes. There, we are letting customers down, and by dropping our reliability here, we are potentially, people who have to put this much effort into simply getting a download are probably starting to think about where else they might go. We've now circled five things. Which three should we work on? And we've seen also three emerging issues here that impact our employees' lives and their ability to focus on these. What are we going to do to improve employees' lives, to enable them to deliver value? So at the end of the day, that's what this work is about. It's about embedding competencies to earn the right to customer-driven growth. On my website, there's all kinds of free material for you to access all of this, and so I hope that um, you found value in this, and I look forward to chatting or um, hearing from all of you. So, Shane, that's what I have for today. Great. Well, I think I, one of the main question, well, questions that are coming out is where can they buy the book besides Amazon? Is there anywhere in the Middle East that would carry it, or can they buy is it, it from your website as well? It's, um, well, my website will send you to different book booksellers. Is it not on, on Amazon in the Middle East right now? I imagine it is, but I think maybe some people who don't want to do an online transaction, are there any Oh, I see. Area? I can find out if it's in any bookstores there. Um, what happens with a lot of books, business books, is they'll bring them in and they'll sell out, and I'm not sure how much they're replenishing those shelves. Um, but that's a really, really good question. What you can do if you go to my website is um, under books, you'll see at the top of the category. If you click on books, there's, there's a drop down and you can immediately download the first chapter of um, both of my, my last two books. So that should get you started at least. Great, great. So we can send the link out. Uh, well, the link's there and uh, people will get the recording. A lot of this stuff now that um, you're, you've touched on is is really big business solutions. I, I mean, especially when you're looking at creating a customer experience room, um, and I think in step five where you're really seeing that convergence across channels, uh, surveys, complaints, social media spiking, and um, you know that operational reaction to that. What about smaller companies? What were some of the things that you can do? You know, if you're only a 20 or 30 million dollar company or maybe a 10 million dollar company where you don't have the huge resources well actually this doesn't these five competencies most of my my even my big companies and we've done this with hundreds and you know thousands of small companies these things don't cost that much this is really about dedicating a, a focus on this building a kill, kill a stupid rule process doesn't cost anything uh, mapping your journey, you can do that. There's lots of resources inside of, um, on the internet. I show some information on it. Lots of people do that. You could do that yourself. Just defining the stages of the journey from the customer standpoint. I actually give you a framework for doing that inside the new book. Um, it, you know, surveys, you don't have to, doesn't cost that much money to do a simple survey. Trending your complaints, for example, is something at Land's End. 
we did it with a piece of paper and a pencil, so people did the fence post method. So this is not about spending money as much as it is really about changing behavior about how you're going to listen and, and drive um, how you grow the business. And, and I, I actually have made a case and I'm doing a lot of work with small business associations now that if you start if you start growing by embedding these businesses in the early days, it will accelerate your growth and, and make you a, have a bigger growth engine, in fact. A lot of what the clients we're working with, it's we're turning them around. But these are the behaviors to start with. Great. Well, if anyone has any questions, uh, please let us know. I can definitely, uh, uh, we can definitely uh, field those questions uh, now if you have any. But I think it's really interesting when you look at your first point, uh, honor customers as assets. And uh, how many, I mean, almost every executive knows what their sales are or their net net new sales are. But if I ask them how many customers did you lose last quarter, I don't I would doubt any of my friends would be able to answer that. Exactly. And isn't that powerful? It's uh, it's really important I think. But I think also you you want to lose some customers, right? Because I think right. some customers aren't profitable. Uh, they, well and that's yeah. Yep, go ahead. So I, you know, I was just saying that you probably, what would be a healthy level of customer attrition or do you, do you have a stat on that? Well, I don't, I don't really, it, it depends on the business or the company, um, but one of the things that, that we've talked about with a lot of big businesses is not what's healthy to a trite, but rather, um, you know, somewhere around 70% of the reasons why, because this is about caring about the why, um, you know, somewhere in the range of 70 to 75 percent of the reasons why people leave, you can have an impact on. You know, yes, some people are going to say price. Yes, some people are going to say market conditions. But the rest of the the reasons have a lot to do with what you're doing inside of the business. Mm. The audience now is just coming back to you and saying, oh, "You obviously have a lot of fans here in the Middle East, by the way." And I've, I've had oh, thank you. Yeah, I heard on the front line, lines, I think, people said that you're amazing and really like to buy your book. Uh, they're saying now that they've, they've listed all the main stores, Kinokokia, uh, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that pr properly, Barnes, Nobles, Magruti, and uh, saying that um, you really can't find it in these stores. So. Oh. Well, I know you can get it online, so I apologize, Barnes and & Noble and Amazon, um, so hopefully that will work for you. Sure. Now, as this new role, the chief customer officer, comes into the boardroom, are they vying for elbow room with the chief marketing officer, with the chief digital officer, with the chief branding officer? Um, you know, is this uh, a, a bit of a, uh, a kind of heated space now? Where does one person's job start? Where does the other one end? Will they be butting heads or will they be dancing together in harmony? How does that work and have you seen these kind of conflicts? in the past? It's a great, great question. In fact, if you have a chief branding officer and a chief marketing officer, that starts to ask questions, right? Um, I think that before you put a role into place like this, a lot of discussion and dialogue has to be had around, first of all, these roles, usually the CMO and the CCO play very, very well together. They should because they're, they're, they're both um, they're both working on the same thing and sorry about that um, they're both focusing on the customer experience but they're the, the most important thing about this when these roles are brought in is there has to be absolute clarity around what the role does and does not um, what we find is important is that the C-suite all has to be a part of even naming and identifying and interviewing a chief customer officer are you there Yes, yeah, I'm right here. Oh, good, okay. Um, I unplugged my phone, so I want to make sure I didn't do something bad to you, Shane, oh, right. accidentally. Um, so that when the chief customer officer is brought in, the, the role is actually not to replace the work, but it's to unite the work. That for a period of time, you know, sometimes this role is four to five years. Let's say I've got large clients, for for example, at Bombardier Aerospace. We brought together this role and a team of people, and then then they did such a good job of embedding it that they were able to um, disband that more formal team. 
but this is not about taking work away from marketing or taking work away from operations. It's uniting and facilitating the embedding of these competencies. And in fact, when a CCO does a really good job, it's to shine spotlight on the leaders and the operations doing the work. The, the last, yeah, and the last chapter of the book actually spends a lot of time talking about the competencies of a CCO and what you should look look for in 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 the skills of someone. And the biggest one for me is check your ego at the door. The work isn't about you. It's not about owning things, but rather enabling the organization to work differently. Right, right. Well, I think that that could be a tip for so many positions in the C-suite. Um, but uh, I think uh, Ab uh, Abdullah is asking if we could please shed some more light on the artifacts and touch points for this. Season. Oh, sure. Yeah. So um, this is a great ex ex uh, question. Sorry about that. Um, what we mean here is bring the touch point to life. So, so let's say a touch point in the business might be um, when a customer wants to um, wants to have a trial offer or wants to sample your product. So what is the screenshot they have to go into? How many times does it take them to call somebody to reach that? What's the form they have to fill out? What do they receive? What's the packaging of it? Is there a follow-up? Um, do you have video of customers talking about their experience of this? Are there phone calls that you can play? The idea of artifacts is to bring the customer to life, bring the experience to life, so that when we talk about this touch point, it's not just, oh yeah, we're working on call time, or we're working on the sample packaging. Right. Okay, well, I think we're, we're I think that's pretty much all the questions we have. Um, did you have any last thing you wanted to add, Jean? No, just um, thank you so much, and feel free to reach out to me. Um, my email is simple. It's jean, J-E-A-N-N-E, -E, at customerbliss.com. You can find that there, and there is all kinds of uh, free tools and information on my website that you can easily download and access. So I, I welcome you to enjoy them, and thank you so much for your time, and I, I hope this adds great value to you. Great. Well, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, for all the audience, there will be uh, a recording of this webinar available that you can download uh, from our website. Um, and uh, we will email out that link uh, to you for everyone who's registered to this event. And again, I'd just uh, really like to thank uh, Jean. I think there's so many uh, tips there which will generate profits, which will help us keep customers, which will help our, us build our businesses and our careers. What a gift you've given us today. Thank you uh, so much, and we wish you all the success moving forward, and hopefully we'll get to see you on your next trip to the Middle East. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. Okay. Bye now.